Lord, as we listen to your word, we get around your word today, Lord, and we thank you, Lord, for who you are. We praise you for who you are. And Lord, we uh, come before you, your throne of grace, uh, Lord, not concerned about tomorrow, because we, because he lives, we don't fear tomorrow. So life is worth living, the future is secure because he lives. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. And that is a blessed assurance that we can hold. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just a wonderful reminder that is um, of the grace of God. That is, uh, that, we, that, that testimony is helpful reminder help remind us um, of the grace of God that he so freely gives to us. Um, amen. So now we come to the word, just a quick hello if you're viewing online, of course, and uh, although you're not with us, I hope you feel a part of it in somehow. But we're going to look at today about the mysteries of the church. The mysteries of the church. I think it's wonderful talking about mysteries. Who does not love talking about mysteries? I love talking about mysteries. It doesn't matter if it's a, you know, a mis an unsolved crime, or it doesn't matter if it's a, uh, you know, even if, it's, even if it's a mystery of, you know, what happens, you know, there are some mysteries around this church, you know, that have been unsolved, you know. We had a mystery once of, uh, you know, I used to hear the water going while I was in the office, and that was a mystery. So I would walk out and find out, well, who's, who's using that water? Out there, those kind of things, you know, the tree being locked and those things, and you know, we had a we had a mystery once of the of, of the weeds in the garden being weeded, like where did where did those go? We were in the gardens, uh, those kind of things. So I love mysteries. I've talked about mysteries, and the church is full of mysteries. And the reason why the church is full of mysteries is because it's full of the mysteries of God. God's a mysterious God. I love the fact that God is a mysterious God. I love the fact that we can't possibly get to know everything there is to know about God because we think, well, hang on, the universe is full of mysteries. I think one of the reasons, like my dad, you know, he's a he's a he's a massive space man, as some of you will know, um, and uh, one of the things that has sort of been bred into me in a way is is there's there's a documentary on space that's on. You can't I can't ever watch it. It doesn't matter if it's the if it's Doctor Professor Brian Cox or who usually presents these kinds of shows. Uh, you look at the stars and the mysteries of the galaxy, and, you know, and they try and use scientific secular terms to try and solve them. They just can't. It's really fascinating to try and to, uh, uh, to view it. Uh, but it's, the, the universe in itself is an example of the mysteries of God. It really is, because they can't solve them. They can't, it doesn't, science cannot possibly explain how we all came to be. Because the truth is that God is above science. Sure, I can talk about big bangs, but in my opinion, in my opinion, that points to the existence of a creator all the more. Because when God says, let there be light, do you think that there would have been a bang? I think there would have certainly been a bang when God said, let there be light. I mean, think about it, it's darkness. And all of a sudden, what did you see? Light. Just like that. I think that would have been an, an, an almighty big bang. I think that would have been. But the universe is an example of the mysteries of God because God created the universe. The church is an example of the mystery of God because Christ started his church through 12 men. That's how Christ started his church. And on this journey of life that we are on, it's a journey of understanding God. And that is basically the Christian life. The Christian life is understanding God. Is, is, is journeying through life with our Creator, living in and through us, but understanding Him. Understanding Him. Learning to understand Him. Learning why I'm chosen. Learning how is it that the Spirit revealed this to me, but hasn't quite revealed to my neighbour yet. I mean, I don't think I'm any smarter than my neighbour. I wouldn't say I'm smarter than my neighbour, but why is it I know this wonderful truth and they don't? Has, have you ever thought of that all of a sudden? I mean, I don't believe we're smarter than atheists. No, I don't. I really don't. But we know the truth. We do. And 
But why is it that that has been revealed to us all of a sudden? And it's accepting and understanding the mysteries of God like that. That meets us where we are. You see, God wants to meet us where we are. And he longs to have communion with us. You know, we, we celebrate communion once a month. It's communion with each other, but communion with God, more importantly. And you see, God longs to have communion with us. He longs to have communion with us. So that's why he sent Jesus in the world to die for our sins. Because he longs to have communion with us. And lately, we've seen the mysteries of God manifest itself in testimony, which we've seen today. Sinners like you and me feel and touch and see God, and see God working for our basic needs. We feel, touch and see God, and God doesn't treat us how our sins deserve. That's why testimony is so wonderful, because God doesn't treat us how our sins deserve. Our sins deserve far worse than what we get. I mean, all the stories about God's come through for us and answered our prayers. Well, we don't deserve it. It's just, it's, just, it's just the grace of God. That's what it is. But he doesn't treat us how our sins deserve. And that's an example of the mystery of God right there. In his grace, he grants us mercy. And he shows his care and his love for us for answering our prayers. Most of our prayers are earthly concerns. You know, I'm not, I'm not diminishing the stories we've heard, but they are earthly concerns. We are concerned about those things. That's not to diminish those testimonies. It's just the truth. The truth is we do have earthly concerns, things like sickness, things like how we're going to cope and survive in this world. And the Bible says not to worry about these things. Think of the birds. I feed the birds. Are you not more important than the birds? And I think to myself, yeah, you know what? I'm not going to be concerned about tomorrow because I know that I'll be looked after. Because my God looks after the birds, looks after the animals. He will look after me as well. He will look after me too. And we saw a mystery of God manifest itself last week in those preachers that we had last week. Such confidence. And boldness beyond their years. Wisdom beyond their years, too. Have you ever talked to a teenager these days? I tell you what, they cannot communicate. They really can't. I play soccer with a few of them. I meet a few of them when I'm playing soccer. And you talk to them, and they're like, whoop, whoop, whoop. It's like, I've got to talk. It's like, what do I do? I'm, I'm, I'm talking. It's like, you know, because they've got the message. Text people. They go to war to try and talk to you. But I guarantee you they can message you. They can message you, no dramas. Those teenagers we had last week, such confidence and boldness and communication beyond their years. Their views. I thought. And just understanding, seeking God with everything they had. That in itself was a mystery. I mean, I mean, think about it. I mean, look, you guys have got grandkids. You know, and that's, that's, that's a big deal. You know, going to a place where, you know, they don't know people that are there and stuff. I mean, some of us get, I mean, some of you get stage fright just talking to people you know here. You know, these kids come and in an environment they don't know. I think it's wonderful. I think it's amazing. And that's, that's, that's an example of the mystery of God right there. But what about the church and where we are now? Until Christ returns, the church will make her pilgrimage. So you know what a pilgrimage is, right? It's a journey. In the midst of world of the world's persecutions. Christ has decided that he'll make the church pilgrimage, journey, right in the middle of persecution. It started right from the Jewish leaders. It, started, it continued with the Romans. It continued through centuries and centuries of human history until we get to where we are today. Right from where we are today. Why has Jesus chosen persecution for the church to make its home in? It's like Jesus wanted the church to make its home in the middle of persecution. Why has Jesus chosen to do 
the church that way. Chosen to build his church that way. You know why that is? Because the church is to be in the world with a spiritual connection to the Father through Jesus Christ. But while we have that connection with the Father through Jesus Christ, we need to be in the middle, in the middle of persecution. Otherwise, why would we, would we need God? If, we've, if we can sort out life easily in our own strength, why would we? It also says in the Bible that trials will perfect us. We are not perfect, but we are being perfected. What is perfecting us is persecution. Let's read James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. It'll just be up on the screen. Thank you very much, Rita. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any of many kinds. Because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Not lacking anything. That verse tells us that our trials and tribulations are perfecting us. Our trials that we go through in this world are actually perfecting us. That's what it's doing. It's helping us in this journey in pilgrimage of life that we're going to towards perfection. The verse tells our trials and tribulations will be our lot until Christ returns. Because they're perfecting us until the day of his return. We have to have faith to be able to endure these trials and tribulations. It's only by faith that someone can see that the church as a visible reality that exists in history. The fact that the church is visible is faith. It being a visible reality, it exists in history, but it's also a spiritual reality. That in itself is another mystery for church. It's a physical reality. I mean, you can see me, I can see you. All of us serve, we keep the church going. That makes the church a physical reality. But it's also a spiritual reality the same time. It's a spiritual reality because what's it doing? It's bringing divine life to earth. That's the role of the church to bring the divinity to the physical. We combine the divinity and the physical. That's what we combine. We merge those two together. Christ, the church is the bride. Christ is the groom. That is the divine and the physical coming together. Is. We are to meet these two in this earth. That is a great mystery of the church. The visible meeting the spiritual. Heaven colliding with earth. Remember what I said earlier about the mysteries? Earth in the midst of the universe. Heaven is far beyond the universe. Yet we merge these two on earth. We are Christ's mystical body on earth, but it's visible, yet also spiritual. And it connects the earthly realms with the heavenly realms. That's what it does. You see, love never fails. And love in itself is a spiritual reality. There are prophecies that point to love. They will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. That's basically life in itself. Let's just read uh, Colossians 1, verse 27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's a mystery right there. To them God has chosen to make known among them, the Gentiles, the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glorious mystery is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Love never fails, prophecies cease, knowledge will pass away, but love will never fail. 
Christ in us is the hope of glory. Christ and his church is the nuptial. That's the mystery. The great mystery, the manifold wisdom of God. Remember Ephesians chapter 3 is taught that the principality is that Christ is one with the church. We revealed the great mystery, the manifold wisdom of God, that the principality is that Christ is one with his church. And we teach that to the principality, is that all of us, as diverse as we are, as corrupted by sin as we have been, we meet Christ and we are one with his church. And that teaches a very powerful mystery to the principalities and powers of this earth that we read about in Ephesians chapter 3. Because the divine now meets the broken. And that's being taught to angels. That's being taught by to demons. What a great mystery that is. Our whole purpose, that is to mirror humanity. How the church is to live with Christ and how the church is to live together is to mirror humanity. Our whole purpose in life is to unite men and women with God. That's our only purpose in life. To have what we have united with God in the church, but united men and women to God. How the church is to function is how humanity is meant to function. Men and women united with God. We mirror how society we are to mirror how humanity is meant to function. That's the purpose of the church, to reflect humanity, to reflect how we want to see humanity, how humanity is intended to function. Working together with, with Christ as our head. The church's performance is measured on how well we respond to the bridge groom's call. Our unity with the bridge groom is the key to finding unity on earth. We underestimate the power of the church because man's unity is rooted in God. That's where man's unity is rooted. It's rooted in God. Let's read Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. From every nation, tribe, people and language, Standing before the throne and before the Lamb, they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hand. You ever wondered why women have the, want to have the white wedding? They wear the white dress when they get married. It's to reflect that confidence. Wearing white robes, holding palm branches in their hand, symbolising the multitude of, of us standing before of, uh, of us standing before Christ unblemished. White is unblemished. That's what that is to represent right there. The church that we live in, a great multitude that no one can count, every nation, tribe, people and language, standing before the throne, standing before the Lamb. And that's reflected us here in a very small way. That reflected here in a small way. We are a sign of unity that's yet to come. There's going to come a time, like that verse says, where a great multitude of people will stand before the, before the throne of God from every nation, tribe and people, holding palm branches in their hand. Why palm branches? You know, that's what they did on the Sunday before, before when Jesus was riding to Jerusalem to signify victory. A conquering king. That's what they used to wear. And that will be us in the future. The church is a sign of unity that's yet to come. The gospel, which was kept hidden from the prophets, is now available to all the church. It's now available to all humanity because the church now becomes global. And it's a representation of what is to come in the end. That's what the church is. We should actually look forward to the end times. Yes, there's going to be some persecution before we get there. But we should look forward to the end. Think about it. You know, I if if you look forward to I mean look, there's 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 lots of things in life we might look forward to. You know, we might look forward to our birthdays coming up. You know, we might look forward to my Stuart's birthday tomorrow, by the way, I'll 
you know, I just want you to throw that out there. I should, oh, I should mean it's her birthday tomorrow. She, uh, anyway, we'll go, we'll go a bit more about that later. But, you know, you might look forward to your birthday, uh, for example. And do you think every day, every step is a step close to my birthday? All of us should think every day is a step close to the end. And what will the end mean? What will mean this? What will we experience from Revelation 7? Humanity coming together as one before the throne of God. The prophets is now is so global. The church is the representation of the human race finally becoming one. That's what we are. We are starting something that we want to see the world, I mean world peace. We are starting it in our own small way right here. And our role is to see men and women united to God. And then they become the church. And the church becomes global. You want to see world peace? Start by unifying the church. I know there's I know there's lots of conflict in the world right now. You know, I think of you know, I think of you know Ukraine and Putin, all these people, China, you know, the AUKUS agreements and all that kind of thing, you know, how they're preparing for conflict. You know, it's quite sad really. I mean, I know AUKUS has been in the news this week. But the reason why there's an AUKUS agreement is because they're expecting conflict. That's why there's an AUKUS agreement. Uh, there, there is. But you know what? We can, do, we can do something small right here in this place. And we can look to unify men and women with God. Live together as one. And who knows? Christ can work in the midst of this. If we become united, if we can we unite people to God? Isaiah talks about the government is on his shoulders. The government rests upon his shoulders. If we can do our bit, and trust God to work through us. Christ had that government on his shoulders. That's what Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7 talks about. If we just do our bit, if we commit to do our bit, we commit to living peacefully, living together as one, looking to unite as many people we can as God, Christ will work through that. He will work through that. And he will surprise us because he always keeps his promise. Once the church is united and whole, then we'll see people come to know God from every tribe. There's division in the church. You know, I remember someone saying to me once who wasn't quite sure, saying, how do I know what to believe? You guys don't even know what to believe. And it's hard to argue with that because you see, you know, you've got the Catholic church, you've got the Baptist church, you've got the Presbyterian church. Even the Baptists have got disunity. You know, there's a Baptist church. You may have heard of an independent Baptist church. You may have heard of a strict Reverend Baptist Church. You may have heard of and And if someone was to say to me, you guys don't even know what to believe, and I see these things, and I think it's hard not to argue with it <laughs> when I look at these things. But you know what? We still, got to, we, still, we still have got to respond to the bridge groom. That's a measure of our performance. Respond to the bridge groom and unify people with God. If they're not unified with the church, so be it. But when they're unified with God, they're going to want to be unified with his people. And that's what we want to do. Unify people to God. Don't think of the church. Just unify people with God. And I guarantee you that when people are unified with God, they're going to want to be with his people. And that's where the church comes in. Seeing people know God through every tribe. I think it's a wonderful thing to pray. Lord, we want to see people unified, come together as one. And, and Lord, we can, do our, we, can, we can start small in this little environment, unifying people to God, seeing the beauty of God manifest itself in us and in creation. Help us to unify people to God where we're at. Help us, Lord, to experience you. Help us, Lord, to know you. Help us, Lord, to understand you. When we understand you, God, we can understand what you are doing. We can. I mean, we never understand God, but we can understand what you are doing, Lord. And we can trust you. We can trust you. Help us to trust you so that when we have that relationship out of love and obedience, we can trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't need to understand. I just need to trust. I think that, that song goes. I don't need to understand. I just need to trust
Amen. Uh, we're going to sing one more song, and then we're going to have morning tea. I'm getting very hungry, so I'm looking forward to this morning tea. <laughs> I am. I can't wait. I can't wait. It's going to be wonderful. I think it will be. And uh, if you'd like prayer, of course, uh, yeah, come and see us. If you'd like prayer, that would be great. We'll end on that. Thanks, Chris. Mm.